If you want to learn statistics for data science, where do you even start? We are all suffering from information overload. If we pick up any statistics book, you might come across a lot of traditional statistical concepts that might be no longer relevant or important in modern data science. That's why I put together a short list of the basic statistical concepts that are most useful from a data science perspective, and I'll also explain why. In this video, we're going to cover statistics for exploratory data analysis, where we discuss the estimates of central values and variability, data distribution, correlation, and exploring variables. Next, we look at data and sampling distribution, where we talk about sampling, bias, sampling distribution of a statistic, the bootstrap, confidence intervals, and an overview of the main types of distributions. Again, to avoid information overload, we are not covering the more specialized topics such as statistical experiments and significance testing, regression, statistical machine learning, and unsupervised learning. This is because I believe these topics might not be relevant for you unless you're doing machine learning or hypothesis testing in your work. So I'll leave these topics for future videos. Now let's grab a nice cup of tea or coffee for yourself and let's get to it. The most basic topic in statistics is probably the estimates of central value and variability of the data. They are going to be your bread and butter when you are doing descriptive analysis on your data set. I'm pretty sure most of you are already familiar with most of these concepts. The most basic estimate for central value is the mean, aka the average value. A variation of the mean is a trimmed mean, or truncated mean, which is the average of all values after dropping a fixed number of extreme values. Another variance of the mean is the weighted mean, or the weighted average, which is the sum of all the values times the weight divided by the sum of the weights. For categorical variable, we can't calculate the average value, so instead we use mode. The mode is the value or values in case of a tie that appears most often in the data. And we also often look at median, which is the value such that one half the data lies above and one half the data lies below it. And lastly, we have outlier. And as suggested by its name, it is the data value that is very different from most of the data. Now, let's look at the different estimates for variability of the data. Firstly, deviation is the difference between the observed values and the mean. It is also often known as errors or residuals. Variance, aka mean squared error, it is the sum of the squared deviations from the mean divided by n minus 1, where n is the number of data values. You may ask why it is divided by n minus 1 instead of n. Good question. There's a long story behind this, but basically it is the correction for the underestimate of the true variance of the population using a sample. Well, there's a whole mathematical proof behind this, but I don't know it by heart and I guess it's probably too much detail for this video. Standard deviation, aka Euclidean norm, it is simply the square root of the variance. Mean absolute deviation, aka Manhattan norm, it is the mean of the absolute value of the deviations from the mean. Another useful statistic is the range. It is the difference between the largest and the smallest value of the data, very simple. You might also have heard of percentile, which is the value such that p% percent of the values take on this value or less and 100 minus p% percent take on this value or more. This concept is identical to quantile, except that quantile uses fraction, for example 0.8 instead of percentage, for example 80%. And this percentile thing results in another statistic, which is the interquartile range. It is basically the difference between the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. When comparing two or more variables together, there are different techniques you could use depending on whether the variables are numeric or categorical. Scatter plot, heat maps, hexagonal binning, and contour plots are useful when comparing two numeric variables together. They all give us a visual representation of the two dimensional density. When it comes to comparing two categorical variables together, a useful way to summarize them is to use contingency table. A famous example of contingency tables is a pivot tables in Excel. When you want to compare a categorical variable with a numeric variable, box plots are usually a simple way to visually compare the distributions of a numeric variable grouped according to a categorical variable, as shown in this example. 
While box plots are useful and more clearly show the outliers in the data, sometimes it doesn't show some nuances in the distribution of the data. So sometimes violent plots are more useful. Now, what if you want to visualize more than two variables in one plot? Well, here's bad news. With a 2D space, you can't, theoretically. But you could do it by creating several plots showing the correlation between two variables by a third variable. And that is how you can analyze three variables at once. Now, let's move on to the next topic, which is the data and sampling distributions, which is the core of statistics. One of the key concepts to understand is that when you collect data, you're sampling from a population. Except in the Internet of Things where we, for example, just collect everything with a sensor. And that is the case of big data nowadays. A sample is simply a subset of data from a larger data set or the population. In the world today of big data and the Internet of Things, you might be wondering why we need to understand sampling. The thing is, even in a big data project, predictive models are typically developed and piloted with samples. In addition, samples are also used in various kinds of tests, for example, pricing, web treatments, or A-B testing. There are different types of sampling. The two most widely used are random sampling and stratified sampling. Random sampling is simply drawing elements into a sample at random. Random sampling makes sure that your resort sample are representative of the larger population it was meant to represent. In stratified sampling, the population is divided into strata and random samples are taken from each stratum. This is quite useful to know. For example, when you are doing a machine learning project, you're gonna need to make sure that your training set and test sets are equally spread out on different categories. For instance, if you're classifying cats and dog pictures, you wanna make sure that both your training set and your test sets have roughly the same cats and dogs ratio. And this is done through stratifying sampling. Now let's talk about bias. Bias occurs when measurements or observations are systematically in error because they are not representative of the full population. Okay, that sounds pretty boring. But basically, it should be noted that hardly any sample, including random samples, will be exactly representative of the population. However, when the difference is significant, sampling bias occurs. For example, if you just look at people who comment in cats' videos, you might conclude that 95% of the world population is cat people. In fact, the people who commented on cat videos are probably did so exactly because they are cat people. This is called self-selection sampling bias, and this kind of bias is very, very common. The reviews of restaurants, hotels, cafes, and so on that you read on social media sites are prone to bias because the people submitting them are not randomly selected. Rather, they themselves have taken the initiative to write because they might have had poor experience or for some special reasons. So it's very important to identify those kinds of bias before you draw conclusions from your data sets. There are actually many, many different types of bias. We've just mentioned self-selection bias, but we also have selection bias, recall bias, observer bias, survivorship bias, omitted variable bias, cause effect bias, funding bias, cognitive bias, and so on and so on. I won't go into the details here. If you're interested though, please go ahead and read up on them. I've added a link in the description box down below. The term sampling distribution of a statistic might sound a bit confusing at first, but basically it refers to the distribution of some sample statistic, for example, the mean, over many samples drawn from the same population. The distribution of a sample statistic, such as the mean, is likely to be more regular and bell-shaped than the distribution of the data itself. The larger the sample that the statistic is based on, the more it is true, as illustrated in this graph below. This phenomenon is called Central Limit Theorem. Central Limit Theorem receives a lot of attention in traditional statistics books because it underlies the machinery of hypothesis testing and confidence intervals, which themselves consume half the space of those books. We as data analysts or data scientists should be aware of this theorem, but since formal hypothesis tests and confidence intervals play a very small role in modern data science, the Central Limit Theorem is not so central anymore in the practice of data science. 
An important measure in the sampling distribution of a statistic is the standard error. It is the metric that represents the variability of the sampling distribution for a statistic. And please do not confuse standard deviation, which measures the variability of the individual data points, with standard error, which measures the variability of a sample metric. You might be wondering, okay, where these samples come from? Do we need to collect the whole, like brand new samples to estimate the standard errors? This is typically not feasible in practice. Once we have a data set, there's little opportunity to go out and collect brand new um, data set again and it also turns out to be not necessary instead you can use bootstrap resamples in modern statistics the bootstrap has become the standard way to estimate standard error of a statistic or of the model parameters bootstrapping basically means to draw several samples with replacement from a sample itself and recalculate the statistic or model for each resample from a data science perspective, knowing how Bootstrap works is very useful for understanding some machine learning models that rely on this method. For example, random forest. It should be noted that the Bootstrap does not compensate for small sample size because it does not create new data. It merely informs us about how lots of additional samples would behave when drawn from a population like our original sample. You might also have heard of confidence interval of a statistic or model parameter. Well, this is exactly what the bootstrap is used for. for. In traditional statistics, confidence interval is often calculated by formulas, especially with t-distribution. You might encounter t-statistics in the output from statistical software such as SPSS or R, but there are not a whole lot of things that you need to understand about it because bootstrap sampling can do exactly the same things. So you might have heard of some types of distributions. The most important and iconic one is probably normal distribution. Despite being called normal distribution, data is generally not normally distributed. Sometimes a distribution is highly skewed or asymmetric, such as with income data where most people would be on a lower income side and only a very, very small percentage of population would have a very, very high income, like millionaires. Assuming a normal distribution is very dangerous, as it can lead to the underestimation of extreme events. As you might recognize if you have read the book Black Swans by Nassim Taleb, there are also other distributions that serve different kinds of purposes, such as t-distribution, as we mentioned earlier, binomial distribution, Poisson distributions, but in the scope of this video, I'd leave it up to you to get to know about them because these distributions only have very specific use cases in data science and most of us won't use them very often. Okay, now you've had a glimpse of the basic statistics that you need to know, but how much is enough? In my opinion, the depth of the knowledge that is expected varies quite a lot across different roles in data science. For example, if your role is deep in the engineering side or the business side of data science, then you might not use as much statistics as you would if you are a data analyst or data scientist. You might do just fine not knowing much about all the fancy machine learning models or Bayesian statistics if you're not going to do any machine learning at all. I hope with this video you've had a better idea of the most important statistics for data science and this is the foundation and it's up to you how you want to expand it or advance it in the future and I'll be with you in that journey. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye bye!